Um, hey, everybody. I hope that everyone is doing well and they're safe. Um, I'm just going to get right to it. I feel like this is going to be a little longer than my usual things because I do want to add at the end a lot of reading material or materials, especially for educators or anybody at this time um, that has to homeschool on any of that. And of course, it's like the number two trending story. And it shouldn't be, but it is. And, you know, as I titled it, or my sister titled it for me, This Damn White Girl, Thoughts from an Actual Afro-Latina or Black Puerto Rican Woman. My name's Rosa Clemente, if this is everybody, for folks who don't know me. And I'm going to do a little bit of a mashup here. It's a lot, y'all. Not this, the, the police killings, all of it together. And as much as I don't want to spend specific time on focusing on another white girl like Rachel Dolezal, you know, not only it's beyond passing because they're actually taking resources away from particularly Afro-Latina women, African-American women in the media, in, in academia. And, you know, it's just a bad look all around. So I like to start by quoting folks. And one of my favorite revolutionaries, philosopher Stephen Beekle said that merely by describing yourself as black, you have started on a road towards emancipation. You have committed yourself to fight against all forces that seek to use your blackness as a stamp that marks you out as a subservient being. I am a black Puerto Rican woman. I'm not Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Latino, whatever is like the new trending word or hashtag. This is not a new conversation for me, but it's not a new conversation in general. There have been generations, particularly in the United States, of what people might call black and brown, what we call African descendants, you know, folks um, in this country. And in 2020, the fact that we are not, we are seeing the type of state violence on our bodies, the state violence on our lands, but what I would call a, a not even a fascist state, look, where we're at, is, is a very dangerous moment. And I think some people can say who've been alive for a long time, well, it wasn't like this before. It's been this bad before. And yes, that's true. But the situation is, is a situation that we can look at the past for guidance, but we can't stay in that past, right? But part of our past has always been resisting, creating our own narratives, telling our stories, not leaving a room when asked, standing up when it's not appropriate. Um, it, you know, it also could be writing and processing and and being an educator, being a custodian. All of all of these things are incredibly important of who we are as part of the stories that we tell, but also how we use these to empower us to be able to be in the streets and to create movement, to create organizations, to create institutions. And the reason I read that Stephen Beagle quote is because there's been a lot in the last two years, particularly this growing narrative that, quote, Latino, Latina, Latinx people are anti-Black. And, you know, what I always say to that, very simply, is that the whole world is anti-Black. The reason we talk about Black people in the Western Hemisphere, in the Caribbean, or we call it the diaspora, is because, I mean, millions and millions, maybe 50, 60, 70 million Africans were taken from the continent of Africa, put through a metal passage, and ended up, whether here in the United States, whether in the Caribbean from Puerto Rico to Antigua to Belize to Panama to, you know, all throughout Latin America, Central America, the border of um, Mexico, all these places, right? So 
we're in a time where people are still questioning or or basing blackness as just phenotype. And look, I I always, you know, am very cognizant to understand that I am lighter skin. I have privilege. What African American women go through in this country, or let's talk about colorism and darker skin women is something that I don't know in that way. But what I do know is that this only serves at this point, white supremacy. And it only serves the media elite, academia, the Hollywood elite who want to make us into a brand, who want us to think that because there's 60 millions of us that we have this level of political power, this capitalistic power. And unfortunately, none of that is true. And what I mean by political power is uh, what they view political power as voting for someone to do the right thing for your people. And if we were even to look just outside of the identity piece right now, specifically on, on Afro-Latinx identity or, or what I say by myself as a Black Puerto Rican woman and my identities that intersect, yo, white supremacists, the police, the state, white militia have aligned themselves at this moment with the forces of capitalism. And all that is gonna to continue to lead to is death by the state, violence by the state, our families being broken, um, you know, and I don't mean broken and what people think a family living in a space is, our communities. Even if we look deeply into the COVID crisis, in California, almost half the cases are Latinos, you know, and that would demographically make sense because California is the predominantly Latino state along with, with Texas now. But all of that means is that here in 2020, we've had the we have the most elected officials, African American, Latino, Asian, indigenous folks, and look at where we're at in 2020. We're at a place where six months ago in Rochester, New York, where they have a black mayor, a black police chief, where we have a black attorney general, Letitia James. You would think that this violence, murders, lynchings, executions by the police would stop because a city has people of color running it. There is no way the mayor of Rochester did not know what happened that night. And there's hell no way that the police chief, and I can speak to this very specifically. I'm in Albany, New York, Rochester's two hours away. If people see the last, I, I went to school here, I lived here and I'm back here, you know, and I've always told people, they look at New York state as New York city. They don't understand from, Af um, from Albany all the way to Buffalo, the Canadian border, there are 8 million people in, in the state alone, you know, past New York City. And the police brutality I've seen here is some extra demonic shit, y'all. That's why they could have this brother in March, which is cold in upstate New York, in the middle of the night, naked, lying down, his, a police, one of them out of the seven, had their foot on his head while he's on the cold ass payment at like 3 a.m. in the morning because his brother called the police because he was having a mental health issue. There is no way they haven't known about this video from the night that it happened. So it took the family to be able to release it. I've been an organizer for 25 years. The first footage I've ever seen of police violence was Rodney King. What I saw the other night, I, I told one of my sister comrades, Dr. Melina Abdullah, I texted her, I said, did you see this? And she said, not yet. And it's the first time where I wanted to be like, don't watch it, knowing that of course she will and that some of us will. And it literally reminded me of what a vessel of a, a, of a ship that was carrying enslaved people looked like, naked, 
black bodies, you know, being stolen and dispersed for capitalism and materialism. This is, I didn't, people know I'm emotional, but I really didn't think I would get emotional like that about this. But, um, and I'm like, if this is not ending, this is obviously for something bigger that they're planning. And the alignment of these white supremacist militia, starting with the, the top and all the people complicit around what's happening, I think Democratic Party is complicit as well. You know? So if people think we're going to get some type of relief because you vote someone else and as a president under this current two party duopoly, I don't know. You know, I, when I ran, with Cynthia McKinney 12 years ago, I not only was a little naive, I was, things still had a little hope that we could somehow create a third party. And the reality is that it's not that people haven't tried to create a third party, is that the duopoly comes together and also aligns itself to keep power. So yeah, we may have an AOC, and two other people, three, four at the top, maybe. But the problem is, is that the Democratic Party itself does not enjoy the benefits of the empire. <laughs> they just don't like who's running it right now. And then on just 100% real, like I don't want this megalomaniac in office. I know that it, 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 it's not even appropriate at this point to say one equals the other. But it's also very important that we get or create new movements that are not all talking about voting people into office. And that comes from the streets. The streets are ready. We as movement and organizers have to figure out our role um, and, and how we wanna be in this movement. Of course, also within this COVID crisis, so I don't judge how anybody's actually like what they want to do. We got to hit it from all sides. What I'm saying is that the way we achieve power is bef before anything, reclaiming who we are, that they try to take this and that we're still here. So this is why I don't use those words. I'm not Hispanic. I'm not a descendant of Spain. You know, I don't, Latina, Latinx, Latino, I get it, gender neutral, I understand that. But those words alone take away racial, our racial, or um, how we identify around race, our ethnicity, our nationality, right? And folks are here trying to still erase our African roots and center or make it into a brand that now is looking like it's phenotypically like a lot of, white maybe used to be passing Latina people, Latino people, talking about us, those that identify as Afro-Latina or Black Puerto Rican or understand, you know, the complexities of who we are, not only how we look, but the politics that we push forward. So people in my crew, they reject their colonizers and rapists and plunderers, you know, I am so over that particular discourse. And I said, if folks wanna use words that have no ties to who we really are, who don't understand how language is power and the most powerful thing one can do in an anti-black world is to claim our Africanness and our blackness, period. So, you know, my personal experience, it begins in college. It does not begin because I was born and partly raised in the Bronx that I grew up in Westchester County, writes out of, writes out the Westchester County is the outer boroughs of New York City um, in a very small town, Elmsford, New York. Um, went to Alexander Hamilton High School. Yes, that was the name. And um, I, I really don't remember a lot of racial or any talk about race you know, when I was in middle school. What I do remember is when Yusuf Hawkins was murdered, 
I think that was 1988 or 89, that some of the brothers in school were talking about it at the lunch table, you know? And I'm sure there's things, right, that my I know my parents face, I face everybody that I know has faced, but for me, college, which I went to SUNY Albany here in Albany, New York, where I am now, if I didn't go to college, I wouldn't even be here. Like, I don't think I'd be here physically, and I definitely wouldn't be here mentally. For me, SUNY Albany and Black Studies particularly, all my Black women professors, all my comrades, some to this day from that time in the early 90s, Black organizations on campuses, we were tearing shit up. <laughs> like, there were protests everywhere. If anybody looks at those of um, the experiences of the 90s in, in, in college, it was a really dope time. You know, not only did you have this complexity in hip hop culture, um, there's some black studies department, Puerto Rican studies departments that exist that now don't exist. There was always live, like real discourse in that. And I think part of it is social media. Also, it's like, you know, I went to school in 1990 to 95, almost 25, 30 years ago. Of course, um, things have changed, you know, especially on college campuses. But the turning point for me, and I'm going to be very specific because I think it is anyone who wasn't born in a movement family, which is most of us, anyone that didn't have any idea about, you know, patriarchy, capitalism, um, all the isms, you know, and now transphobia, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer folks, you know, which we weren't talking about in the 90s either. So, you know, things in, in terms of discourse and how we look at each other often do move forward. But it was in 1993. I had joined the Albany State University Black Alliance. And our sister organization, Fuerza Latina, right? Now, ASUBA, as we called it and still called, said that it was open to all people of African descent. So this brother, Derek Westbrook, who was in it, had come up to me and said, you should join the organization, and I did. And it was just a turning point for me. It wasn't only like Derek and my peers and my, my professors. I just began to see, you know, all the history that was stolen from us, that we always learn about the history of oppression, not the history of resistance. And I'll tell you, when I was at SUNY Albany, there was one time where I was questioned and kind of cast aside from a group of people, was the following year when Derek Westbrook said, you should run. He had become the interim president because something happened to the previous president. And I was like, that's crazy. You know, like, I, I'm not running. I'm Puerto Rican. And he, I was like, nobody will vote for me. And he said, no, you're, you know, come on, you're a person African descent, you're black, you know? And I ran and I won. And the next day, there was a group of Latinos on students who wrote um, a piece about basically how I sold out. And then I, when you become president of an organization like that, you end up meeting with the director of student affairs, right? Or, you know, if people are in different academic settings, the deans, or if you're in the streets, you know, the people on the top, you gotta clear, kind of have a conversation with. And, the Latino brother who, who was there basically said, you need to pick. Are you this person of African descent, whatever, or are you Latina or I mean, Hispanic, Latina, Puerto Rican? I was like, dude, you sound crazy. And I walked out. And what I did those next few years is hardcore learning about movement work and organizing about it. So in 1993, Dr. <laughs> Maita Moreno Vega came up to speak and she was the first person I ever said, heard, or let me say first Puerto Rican that I had heard say I'm a person of African descent. And I went up to her and I, I remember it so clearly because it was for Hispanic Heritage Month. 
And straight up, after she stopped speaking, there were like 10 of us that stood up and clapped. <laughs> oh, Lumumba's on, <laughs> which I'm about to put you in the story because you belong. And I was like, I want to learn from you. And she's like, here's my number. And the following year, I talked to her. And I happened to be an intern at the New York State Assembly. And she said, well, the Caribbean Cultural Center, we go up there every year because in that time period, arts in New York was being well-funded, but there was still like, well, not well-funded, but there was also an equity in that funding. And Lumumba, I don't remember if you were already working, probably, yeah, you were probably already working or interning or something. And I met Lumumba and yo, the next, Two years, you know, they would come up and then I decided to go to Cornell University. That's where I met Dr. Turner and, and Dr. Turner recruited me. He's like, you need to write about the Young Lords Party, COINTELPRO and racial identity as a Puerto Rican. That's what I did in my, my thesis. And when I um, moved back to Brooklyn, you know, the first people I talked to were Lumumba and Monifa Bandeli, Akamuli Bandeli, and I started staying with them in Brooklyn and I joined the Malcolm X grassroots movement today. It's my political home. You know, um, a lot of us play different roles in Malcolm X grassroots movement, but without being in, in MXGM and really being embraced in particularly quote black spaces, you know, I began to identify like I'm African descendant, black Puerto Rican. I, and to this, I don't really care if people call me Afro Latina and all of that, but you know, I will tell you that there's been like this reoccurring history in all of these spaces is that like, it's like, seems every couple of years, new people begin to question um, someone like me that says they're black Puerto Rican. Um, you know, they'll be like, you're, met, you're, you're light skin, you're not dark, which is utterly ridiculous, right? And um, all these things, and what I often say is like, again, who does it benefit um, to have such a narrow viewpoint of not what blackness is, but also what black liberation is, you know? And for me, that was a very, very uh, liberating time. So I think everybody has to go through their own process in that, you know, but I also think, that um, it's incumbent that we talk about someone like Frantz Fanon, who talked about not only our colonized um, lands, but our colonized minds, right? And that we always have to affirm in a new generation and, and you know, who we are. And then in a moment like this, we have to not affirm it just because it's like, you know, here's another white girl passing. How did this happen and <laughs> all of this, like, like, what are we doing? Background checks? I don't know. How do you do a background check about that? I know about some certain other things, right? But one of the other things about that time in my life was that hip hop and poetry was like so alive. And I remember reading Willie Pedomo's poem, Nigger Reek and Blues, you know? And one of the groups that we all used to roll with a lot, the Welfare Poets and their Project Blues album, okay? This is almost 20 years, but I encourage everybody like, you know, especially if you're an educator, go out there, just listen to the album. And, and one of the parts from the album says, who we be, who I be, who we be. I, singular I. Now the essence of those Africanos and that of Los Indio run within me. So when you call me Spanish, all my purity seems to vanish because that is not who I be. So don't refer to me with words that blew the trueness to my identity, defining me by a colonizer's language, disregarding my family lineage, my ancestral heritage. Now I be the rhythm of the conga, played to an internal bomba, extending from Nigeria, from a culture called Yoruba. And that's for me, look, you know, that's where it is for me. So that is my starting point, and it, it will has guided every decision, most decisions as it regards movement or me being in the field of black studies, 
or me continuing to, you know, try to organize and all of that. Without it, I wouldn't, I, like I said, I wouldn't be here. So of course, you know, when this dropped, <laughs> my homegirls were like, yo, did you see this? I was, said, no. And I read it and I was like, all oh, right, like this shit happens, you know, but when it starts to trend, I, I want to respond in a way I want to feed into that, but everything can be a teachable moment, right? I guess. And so I, I just printed out some of my, my girls who um, were very eloquent in less than three lines about this situation, right? So first, uh, my girl, Marty Nevis wrote on her Facebook, my feed, phone, and ears ringing with the noise of the fake Afro Boricua from El Barrio. All I have to say is that she needs to figure out how to repay all that black fellowship money she stole, needs to step down from her tenure position. Why? Because she's a liar and ethics matter as much as academic rigor. And it is death, punto, the end. More importantly, this week we learned of the police murders of Dijon Kizzy, Dion K, and Daniel Prude. This week, this is savage, savagery, American savagery. And then Claudia de la Cruz, another dope ass, dope ass sister said, my timeline been lit up with the Bombalera story for the last two days. As my grandma would say, keep your eyes on the prize. She came out because she was soon to be ousted or at this moment is more profitable to re up in a scandal. Because if she wasn't known, well, now she is. Two, good old hood background checks are necessary, especially in a world of smoking mirrors and imposters. And that's my two cents. I was like, yeah. Also this week, another of my homegirl, dope, Elizabeth Mendes Berry, along with another sister, Monica Climetis, you know, who's been doing incredible work, just incredible, incredible work, put out an opinion piece called How Latinos Can Win the Culture War, where they also begin to talk about like white gatekeepers, especially in media. And Elizabeth said in, in her tweet, she said, it looks like this fake Afro-Latina may get more press in one day than real Afro-Latinas in a year. Exactly. And instead of giving her more attention, let's spotlight actual Afro-Latina scholars, writers, artists. And she drops uh, Loida Limbal, so many other sisters, Johanna Fernandez, um, Sofia Quintero, you know, me, thank you for dropping me up in that, you know, Elizabeth, and, you know, goes down the list. You know, so at this point, the only thing that I think those of us who identify as Afro Latino, Latina, Latinas, you know, Black, all of that, we need media representation and not, I'm not even talking about mainstream. Progressive media is hella white. Um, where I see the most people being published like me would be in, you know, Black. Um, depending on, on, on what black um, news website, but we could look at Essence, The Root, we could look at, um, you know, you know, journalists like Rakia Mage, Jamila Lamu, sisters like Joan Morgan, Sophia Chang. Like, I could look, call out sisters for days who have created space, um, who are in that mainstream media landscape, but also kind of left um, black media landscape, right? And that's why I had started the show Disrupt the Chaos. I mean, originally I was just going to do Afro Latina, uh, black identified kind of topics. And then I said, no, you know, I got it. It's not about it being just a separate piece, it's about weaving it into every show that I do because that's how many of us are here, exist, and that's how many spaces and stories still need to happen. Because with all this said, I am not the be all end all of Afro Latino, Latina, Latinx identity. I am not, you know? Um, and I think, you know, people have created a narrative where 
some of us who have been doing this work for a long time, you know, that we expect something. You know, I don't expect shit because my loyalty is to the people. My loyalty is to my family, my loyalty is to my comrades, my friends, the streets, the people. My loyalty is not to an academic institution, capitalism, all, all of that. With that said, I participated in all of that. This shit is messy, it's complicated, you know? And the older I get, the more I have to like really be like, yo, you know, someone gave you room to grow. Someone gave you room to fuck up. Someone gave you room to come to your own conclusion on who you were. Someone gave you room to begin to question things that you think you should have done better or never been part of or any of that, you know? And that's what space I'm comfortable in now. And I want to highlight younger people and, and I want to highlight our people that are talking about true black liberation and what that looks like. Not because it's fucking trendy or it's going to end up on some TV show script or any of that, you know? And with that said, I had to say to myself, then you need to stop complaining and create something. That's what Micah taught you. Um, your elders have always, in fact, our elders have built institutions. What are we building right now? Seriously. We can't just be building a movement based on a hashtag. That's not a movement. We need to actually be, as people are doing in Detroit and mothers in California, taking over abandoned houses, having so far fire farm and these places multiply. We need organizations now even more than ever. But I think that we also need, like, I'm clear what my role is going on. You know, and I think that comes with just straight humility, <laughs> um, things failing, things working, humbleness, you know, but also age. Yeah, I'm about to be 48. Or am I going to be 49? I'm about to be 49 in April. Look, I spent half my lifetime if I live to be that long. I don't have time to waste. So I can either complain about shit or build it. And even in building it, there'll be failures. And, you know, 9 million people already know this that know me. I got a dissertation to write. You know, I get all that. We're in a crazy global pandemic. <laughs> but what I will say is that I know my dissertation should be done, but damn, <laughs> at least this year happened to this 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 course to just explode right and then not only finish it but you know bring back disrupt the chaos and that's that and i'll build it because there'll be people that support it and i'll build it because i want to give it right to my daughter and the young people i'll build it because in albany new york we have youth fx one of the dopest organizations, honestly, that I have seen, been part of, my daughter's part of. But, you know, I've been deeply studying youth effects, which is, you know, very important because these are all like 15 to 25 year olds. And not only do they understand the media landscape and can break it down, they also know all the technology. Like my daughter was like, you have the wrong lights on you. You're going to look mad white if you don't put the orange, whatever bronzer thing on. So, you know, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. You know, so I've already spoke for 35 minutes. People can take it, want to make it into a podcast, do whatever, share it, you know. But I do think that now what we have to do is it happened. There are, I'm sure, thousands of conversations, millions happening right now in all types of crews family circles, you know, but after watching that, the, the, the murder of Daniel Perdue and how many more names, right? Like Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, Ahmed Arbery, Sean Montesoto in California, 
Rashard Brooks, Dijon Kizzy, Tony McDade, Leyland Polanco, Miguel, Ve Miguel Vega, go to Rebel Diaz. They put this on, on August 31st. Miguel Vega was shot in the back of the head in the Pilsen area of Chicago by the police on the 31st. We haven't heard a lot about that, right? You know, this is something that I don't think anybody anticipated, the veracity and rage and as Mahdi said, the savagery of the system, but it's happening so fast. And again, all within this global pandemic. And I, I, I do believe that these white supremacists are literally target practicing and they're preparing to, they're preparing for sure if Trump loses. And if Trump, and I say if, because yo, know, there's no reason that Joe Biden isn't like at 80%. I'm sorry. You know, but there's definitely a reason why the Democrats seem to always <laughs> just be real moderate and mediocre. When Joe Biden made that speech, I was like, why is he condemning, quote, rioters, protesters, and looters? Right, because you helped write the criminal justice bill of 1994 and your VP pick used to call herself the top cop in California, right. And if he thinks speeches like that are gonna engender particularly young people to come out and vote, then what the, what the hell? Of course, some of us are gonna vote for him. You know, some people may not. Some people may not vote, but can the Democratic Party just have a real black plan? Just, you know, like get in there and we'll hold y'all accountable. But, yo, if this dude doesn't go, what does four more years look like under this administration? I'll tell you what it definitely looks like is the feds are straight up picking up people and disappearing them. We don't know where some of these protesters are that the feds are picking up. The shit going on in ICE detention right now. Yo, I don't even think people could really watch some of the video that Democracy Now! has been sharing about what's going on in ICE. We talk about a housing crisis, food insecurity, livable wage, militarism, patriarchy, hyper-capitalism. All of this right now is happening under this cover of the global pandemic. And I am not sure if the Democratic Party could even pretend to give us everything we wanted just like to get in that shit, you know? I don't, I don't think they're capable because I think that their difference again, as I said at the beginning, is really that they're not running things. They're not really interested in the power and people power, right? Come on. Nancy Pelosi, you getting a haircut so someone set you up? I don't even care if they did set you up, then you were stupid to do it. You're getting your hair done in a global pandemic. And like, it's like they keep feeding the Republicans everything they, they need. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what's gonna happen in, in this election. What I am sure is what I always know is that movement and organizing is how we get our way out of any situation. Yeah, let's hold people accountable, but also, all these things that we talk about have real solutions. And there's a lot of dope people online doing a lot of amazing, beautiful work from Puerto Rico to the Bronx, you know, to any geographical location in the United States. There are incredible people doing incredible work and mutual aid. And that's what we're gonna have to depend on. Cause that's what happened in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, right? So, you know, I think we spend like, uh, you know, for me, that's it. I'm, I, I'm not gonna talk about her anymore after this, but I am gonna be supportive of also other Afro-Latino young people coming into your identity. And there are people here, you know, that, that are here to mentor and all of that. But it also takes, you know, some rigorous reading and, and seeing what people have been talking about from Schomburg on to, someone like Carlos Russell or Umberto Brown, you know, to me and to now younger people. 
you know, there is only one black Latino journalist on mainstream media and his name is Omar Jimenez. Y'all see him. He's on CNN. Some people say Sonny Huston of The View, but I'm not sure The View is considered like um, media or as a, as a talk show, whatever that means. But the fact is that there's only really two. And that's that in itself is why people are confused when they hear black people, people look black to them speaking Spanish, right? Because you're not taught anything about racial, um, well, obviously race being a construct, but you're also, we're still in a very binary conversation in, in, in race in this country, which usually means a conversation between African-American, maybe European-American people. When we say black people, we mean the diaspora black people, you know, and our, there should be people on from Ethiopia, Somalia and Haiti and everywhere where their black people are should be included in that in United States mainstream media. And of course they're not. So we're still having this very binary discussion, right? And, you know, so I, I hope people check out old episodes of Disrupt the Chaos. I hope that you know, people check out the Black Latinx Organizing Project. I'll share all of that. And sorry, everybody. And that um, I also understand this is an intense time of grief and pain for all of us and that a lot of us are dealing with mental health stuff as well. You know, and I do believe that part of, you know, being mentally healthy is to know who you are and who your people are, where you come from, the work that you choose to do, you know, the small legacies that we choose to lead, the small things we do every day and the big things we do every day, all hopefully at the service of Black liberation, but also like, again, who is your loyalty to? You know, and we can't, something has broken and we cannot sit with this moment and also realize there are a hundred ways to contribute. And that I, I do believe in. I don't have to be politically aligned with every single person. I'm politically aligned with my comrades and organizations, but you know, there's accomplices for justice and other folks too that might not have the same way of getting there, but we know who they are and, and how they're trying to represent us. And it is important policy and all of that, but it can't be our only thing. It just can't. Because if it was, like I said, with all these numbers of elected officials, if it was about numbers, half this country is already, quote, people of color, we would be we wouldn't even be going through a global pandemic because we would have stopped it and already, you know, but there would be no culture, there'd be no politics, there'd be, be nothing without us and our contributions here and throughout the world. And when I mean us, I mean African descendant people, I mean indigenous descendant people, all right? Um, so there's a couple of boop, books out, but there's always a lot of books out, but I do wanna hope that y'all definitely, I mean, I think this is a really good starting point, basically. <clears throat> Diasporic Blackness, The Life and Times of Art Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. This is actually a really good starting point. Okay. Of course, The Altar of My Soul by Dr. Vega who's like dope and will also tell you when you're messing up, which is very important. Um, Woman Warriors of the Afro-Latina Diaspora. You'll see that. And obviously the Afro-Latino reader, well, I shouldn't say obviously. Um, and also it's um, actually last year we really lost a pioneer in this work too. Um, Miriam Jimenez Roman, who passed away. Um, but her and her husband, who had passed away, I think maybe five or six years ago, Dr. Flores, even longer. This is probably the first quote 
reader. No, it's not the first reader here in the United States around that. And it's really good because it's short readings broken up into a lot of things. And there's a dope new book coming out called Decolonizing Diasporas, Racial Mappings of Afro-Atlantic Literature by Yomata Vasquez, right? So look, you know, I try to write things down. I try to go from the heart. I want to make sure I covered a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm like, I think, like I said, you know, let's have that conversation, but also let's definitely keep our eyes on the prize right now. And trying to live is the prize right now. That's what I think. Trying to live and trying to still find some joy in this madness. Um, so yeah, it's long past time we have people who look like us, who represent like us, you know, especially a lot of sisters, that we be represented our stories, be told as part of this larger project of liberation, you know? So hit me up, share it. Maybe we'll edit it better. And um, I really look forward to a lot of the events I'll be doing September and October virtually. And like I said, to bring back Disrupt the Chaos, we're working on some things to bring it back. And, you know, I just hope right now that people, people are just open and, and ready to, to commit to probably what a new world is going to look like. And we have the opportunity to be not only shape it, we will shape it. You know, I do believe that, you know, because at the end, it benefits humanity for us to do the work that we do, you know, and it benefits capitalism to do the work that the state, including its police and um, all those forces are trying to do to us, which some people would say is a continuing, continuing genocide against indigenous black and brown folks in this country. And the way it's going now, I, I would say we're on that path. So we have to be just super clear and, and, you know, supportive for sure. But we got to like, really at this moment, we that pick up the mantle of being a Black Puerto Rican, a Black Colombian, a Black Mexicano, an Afro-Latina, Latino, Latinx person, human, we have to make sure we are not cast aside and put on the margins of our own stories. If we were already born on the margins and may die there, then we better do a lot of work in between, you know, and I believe in that. So um, thank you everybody. You know, I know it was a little long. I came from the heart, try to write some stuff down, hit me up on social media and everybody just stay safe. And you know, fall is coming, you know, seasons change and, um, we just have to be prepared and ready for what comes with that. All right. Peace, everybody. Thank you.